Welcome, innovative viewers, to today's episode of Science and Spirituality. Does mood or state of mind affect how our brain perceives the world? Does having a constructive or negative attitude really make a difference? And what do scientists have to say about this? A research team from the Department of Psychology at the University of Toronto, Canada, recently published their findings in the prestigious Journal of Neuroscience on how our emotional states affect our brain's ability, specifically the visual cortex or part of the brain responsible for detecting simple visual stimuli to perceive the world. The principal investigator of the study is Adam K. Anderson, professor of psychology and the Canada Research Chair in Effective Neuroscience at the University. The lead author of the study is Taylor Schmitz, a PhD student at the University and our guest on today's program. He will be discussing the study's fascinating conclusions. The idea for the study came from prior experiments where it was shown that one's state of mind has an influence on the level of one's cognition or creativity, such as the ability to use abstract thinking to analogize between two words. It was found that those with a constructive attitude had a much easier time accomplishing these types of tasks. So um, we did these studies um, at, um, using behavioral tasks. Mm -hmm. And what we were interested in this current study is seeing if we could extend uh, our behavioral observations to the level of neural activity and actually observe changes in, in patterns of, uh, of neural activity in the brain mm -hmm. while people were engaged in positive and negative moods. Taylor now provides details on how the experiment was conducted. What we did is um, we had a series of undergraduate students that we recruited from the university. And these are healthy, roughly early 20s. It involved basically doing a task where they saw a series of positive, negative, and neutral images, and also a visual spatial task, which I'll get to in a moment. But, um, they just did this task while they were laying in the, uh, the bore of a scanner, of the MRI scanner. Mm -hmm. And um, while they did the task, we measured their brain activity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that was, how, that was how we did the study. The emotional reaction of the students to the images shown was also quantified by way of a numerical scale. Well, so we, we didn't only measure uh, positive affect in terms of neural activity. We also asked the subjects to respond uh, to self-report how they felt while they were in the scanner. So we would show them images and um, they would determine, um, we would give them a rating scale um, during which they would rate um, the positivity of their emotional state um, on a scale of one to nine, with five being kind of neutral and nine being the most positive state that they could be in and one being the most negative state they could be in. After viewing a series of positive, neutral, or negative images, a test was given. We had images of a face stimulus that was presented in the center of the screen in a, in a very small centrally located um, mm -hmm. area. And the subject had to look at this face and just simply determine whether the face was a male or a female. Now, surrounding the image of the face was a image of a house or a building that was in the periphery. And so the face was sort of superimposed over this. Taylor explains the significance of the images featuring a face together with the house. Now, why did we do these sort of random stimulus categories? The reason is, is because there's areas in the visual cortex of the brain that process this, uh, these two uh, types of information and that they're sort of anatomically dissociable. So there's an area in the brain that processes specifically face information. It's known as the fusiform face area. Mm -hmm. And there's also another area of the visual cortex um, that processes, uh, seems to be predisposed to processing place information. This is known as the parahippocampal place area. Mm -hmm. And so this is in an a anatomically distinct location in the visual cortex. And so when you show a person, an image of a face and a place at the same time, these areas of the brain will both light up, as it were. However, when you actually focus your attention onto the face stimulus, this causes your brain to actually enhance that information in the visual cortex. So you can consider attention as almost uh, like a spotlight. By examining the activation in these two areas of the visual cortex, it was found that those with negative feelings were less able to fully process the picture, 
particularly the information beyond the gender of the face, namely the house or place information. In other words, having constructive or positive feelings allowed the brain to grasp the entire image of both the face and the house more easily. And when they were in a negative state, they processed the place information even less compared again to the neutral state. So the attentional spotlight seems to be kind of constraining the search area in negative states of, uh, of what they're processing. So they're only really processing the faces. By contrast, when they're in a positive state, their attention seems to be somewhat relaxed as kind of a way of putting it. So they actually encode more of that place information unintentionally. When we return, we will discuss with Taylor Schmitz what these findings mean in practical terms. Please stay tuned to Supreme Master Television. Welcome back to today's episode of Science and Spirituality. As we continue our conversation with Taylor Schmitz, a University of Toronto, Canada PhD student in the Department of Psychology who is the lead author of a recently published study in the respected Journal of Neuroscience. He and his team members examined how our emotional states, specifically positive, neutral and negative states, impact the brain's visual cortex's ability to perceive the world. The scientists concluded that having a constructive frame of mind allows one to take in more information when one views the world around them, whereas those in a negative state have tunnel vision or a lesser ability to do the same. How do these findings apply in the real world? In a negative state where you're more fixated on a, on a narrow area of, of your visual field, it leaves you less able to integrate other pieces of information in your visual world. And so this is something that can also have uh, negative effects. For instance, if you were um, navigating through a crowd looking for somebody. Mm -hmm. um, that could be an, uh, an example of where it, you would want to have more access to the full extent of your visual field. The results indicate that it is advantageous for us to have a constructive mindset whenever possible, as then we are able to visually take in more of our world. But what if we have a negative mindset? Is it possible to change our thinking and then experience a positive state of mind? Taylor says a method called reappraisal may be the way for us to get back on the positive side. What we're kind of showing is that the brain is, facilitates this narrowness and that that's something that really requires a, a reappraisal of the negative state itself to get out of. Mm -hmm. So if you're in a negative state, sometimes you just need to force yourself to get into slightly more um, positive mode of thinking so that you can access other pieces of information that may contextualize that negative event, whether it's the loss of a loved one or, or just, you know, spilling coffee on yourself. Mm -hmm. Something that could be, you know, that could be negative, you could just quickly tr try to get into a slightly more positive mood and think, well, hey, you know, I've, I've spilled coffee on myself before and it's no big deal. Or, you know, I have, I've lost a loved one, but I have this entire family network that I can rely on for mm -hmm. support and, and that, you know, and using bits of information like this are, are things that, are, that require flexible thinking, that require different perspective taking. And unfortunately, negative moods are not conducive to that mode of information processing. Taylor Schmitz is now repeating the experiment with an older population namely with those who are 70 to 75 years of age. We're in the midst of collecting data to do this. Um, and one of the interesting um, findings that's come out of um, research on older individuals and, and just emotion across the age spectrum is that older individuals are um, consistently rate themselves as having uh, more positive affect than younger adults. Mm -hmm. So in terms of their sort of ratings, subjective ratings of self-satisfaction, mm -hmm. um, they seem to be consistently higher than younger, young adults. Initially, I think we are hypothesizing that because older adults seem to have this positivity bias, so they, they seem to be just generally more positive, uh, is that they actually might be slightly more impervious to the influences of negative emotion. So it could either mean, A, they're just happier, but mm -hmm. negative emotions influence them just as much as they do um, young adults. Or it could mean that 
they're just as happy as young adults, but they're more impervious to the influences of negative information. And maybe that's just because of the age, they have just more experience with, with positive and negative experiences in their life. Mm -hmm. And so they know how to deal with negative. We asked Taylor how the research findings can be applied on a global level. Again, if you were um, you know, at, the, at the geopolitical scale, mm -hmm. I think the the bias in terms of media, of, for sure, is on as on kind of negative portrayals, mm -hmm. because they attract audiences, um, and I think that it's easier to portray negative information than it is to to portray positive information. It's easier to criticize than it is to applaud somebody, mm -hmm. and so this bias, this negativity bias in the media, I think leads to very very narrow and circumscribed perspectives on entire societies and cultures. The conflict in the Middle East is portrayed as very one-sided, you know, um, perspectives on either side of the conflict. Each side has this very narrow perception of the other, mm -hmm. even though they're these incredibly rich cultures that have inhabited this, this, this area for thousands of years and, and you know, and have, there's, have both contributed so much to, you know, science and technology and are these rich rich cultures, and all, none of that is appreciated. This is something that I think if, if more, the more appreciation we could have for these cultures as beautiful, beautiful cultures in and of themselves, that, that we could probably start influencing the way we make some political decisions about how to interact with one another. We appreciate Taylor Schmitz and colleagues for sharing this important research which demonstrates the power of our thoughts to influence how we see the world around us. Our gratitude goes to Taylor Schmitz in particular for introducing us to this study. Thank you esteemed viewers for joining us for today's episode of Science and Spirituality. Coming up next is Words of Wisdom after noteworthy news. May we all live in peace and happiness together. For more details, please visit www.suprememastertv.com forward slash ss.